Tim Pendry, uh, who's come to speak on behalf of the democracy movement, the contribution about Leave.eu as well. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm going to make clear that today I'm speaking for the democracy movement and not for Leave.eu. I'm on the advisory board of the democracy movement, and I attended the first meeting of the advisory board of Leave.eu. So I'm giving you, if you like, the inside information, and others attended that meeting as well. Um, the difference is important, as I will make clear. I'm also going to read from this presentation, which is not usually how I do things. I usually extemporize. But we have to be very careful with language at this time. Um, so forgive me if I'm a little dry at times. Um, it's not my preferred approach. I'm going to try and do three things in the limited time at my disposal, and I'll welcome the questions later. First, I want to tell you or inform you of what the democracy movement is doing in the great cause and recap a little on the history to explain how it's got where it is. Second, I want to give my impressions of what Leave EU, which is one of no less than two Euro realist, Euro skeptic, or Euro critical organizations that have emerged in recent weeks and months, what it is and why I think it's potentially very important. Third, I want to thread the two themes together as I speak and show why the democracy movement is minded to support Leave EU while not yet having made its absolutely final decision, though it's a decision that's expected very soon. I can't emphasize enough that not only democ the democracy movement, Leave EU, and the socialist and democratic organizations operating in this space consider themselves internationalists and true Europeans. To be a true European is to stand for democracy and the self-determination of the European peoples collaborating as nation states on equal terms. That's the legacy of the European Enlightenment, and it's resolutely anti-imperialist. This commitment to being European, but firmly against the European Union, is something that unfortunately has to be stated again and again and again in British contexts, because there's a lie being perpetrated about the Leave camp, which is that it is anti-European, xenophobic, or Little Englander. And the Little Englander one is particularly useful when the Europhiles want to mobilize our Celtic brothers and sisters, and I'm so pleased to see the Irish presence here. Um, we, are, we are brothers and sisters. Nothing could be further from the truth. If anything, the modern British Eurosceptic craves a deeper and firmer cultural connection with our European allies. What he or she will not accept is being dictated to by Eurocrats when we have a perfectly good sovereign parliament and ancient liberties at home. I'll go further and say that while some Eurosceptics are stuck in the old Atlanticist model, the modern British Eurosceptic is very much an internationalist at a much more global level. If he is or she is a Eurosceptic of the left, he or she wants to ensure that global trade and Western power are used to better the lives of the vast majority of humanity that still lives in dire conditions across the world. But if she or he is a Eurosceptic of the right, the emphasis may be on global trade and the betterment of humanity through that means. So there's no incompatibility, therefore, between the trading and the humanitarian approaches. Both right and left will disagree profoundly on means and in some respects ends, but what they have in common is that freedom can only be offered by example by a free people freely determining its laws through sovereign institutions. Having given that cultural background, I can now move on to the democracy movement, which has one of the longest continuous records as defenders of national so sovereignty from a non-partisan partisan point of view in this country. It was founded as all party, that's important to, to note, as the voice who want, of those who wanted to have the risk to democracy of technocracy brought to public notice. Over subsequent decades, it came to link traditional right-of-centre concerns about the European Union with those of the left. It was central to the creation of something called the People's Pledge here, which was a non-partisan movement, which included actually Europhiles as well as Eurosceptics, which demanded and got a referendum. So it's something that the elite would happily have denied us. And a number of Europhiles actually wanted this referendum. And the Eurosceptics worked with them in order to get it, and that's why we're all sitting here today. Tony Blair... I think you've heard of him, <laughs> clearly loathed the very idea of the people making a choice for themselves about the future destiny within the European Union. He said in his Durham constituency <laughs> only this April, think of the chaos produced by the possibility, never mind the reality, of Britain quitting Europe. Well, you know, we, we have a referendum on the way, and I see no chaos in the streets <coughs> or the market, but I'm far too polite to endorse Boris Johnson's assertion that Blair was an, quote, from The Guardian, mark my words, an epic patronizing tosser for making his remarks. <laughs> the point is that the democracy movement and people's pledge helped to make a referendum happen against the mass ranks of the old elite. 
Now that the referendum is assured, and let us pause for a moment and just remember that these guys never let us just say no or leave in this country. Mm -hmm. They always try to come back again and again and again, like the Terminator. <coughs> We will see the same determination this time to see the matter through to a final victory, victory, which is to leave, and it comes again, to leave, but to leave with big letters. We're going to leave. The strategy of the democracy movement in recent months has been to husband its resources. It has limited resources. It, 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 it handles them carefully, which include its substantial mailing list and the campaigning experience led by Stuart Coster and Mark Glenn Denning, who, who sits here and to ensure that those resources are used correctly and to maximum effect when the time comes. So there's an element of reverse engineering from the date, so we don't use up too much resources too early. This is an asset that must not be wasted, and the activists on its list must, must be treated with the utmost respect as fellow soldiers in a shared battle. But the most important aspect of DM, which is how we, use, how we term it internally, is that it's long acted as clearinghouse for contacts between otherwise mutually suspicious left and right Eurosceptics. This has now become invaluable, ensuring that the two wings remain united as we get closer to the vote. The obvious tactic of the Eurocrats is to try to set, and I think this applies to every country, to set left and right Eurosceptics off against each other in the street. Can I emphasize again, this must not be allowed to happen. For the Eurocrats, given their baseline of centre-right, state and big business support for the pro-European position, and again, big business is not business. There's a lot of business that isn't big business. Entrepreneurial business, small business, innovative business. The game is to silence the less and have the old pre-Corbyn elite of the Labour movement and the Labour Party speak as one voice for the European Union. That's the game. Enough Tory Europhiles speak and the Labour movement moves behind it. But it's not going to happen like that for a number of reasons. The first is that the numbers of Eurosceptical left-wingers is much higher than the mainstream press would like you to believe. They've simply been overwhelmed by the groupthink of those who purport to speak for them. They simply need leadership and to know they are not alone. Some became frustrated enough that they drifted across to the so-called Red UKIP as working class people who felt their concerns were not being addressed by New Labour. I'm pretty reliably informed, because of my own context, that many of these people who are not racist, they are not xenophobes, are now coming home to Labour with the arrival of a new leader in Jeremy Corbyn, which is a critical factor in the domestic uh, situation, who is clearly more open to the concerns of working people and to open debate, which is critical, on difficult issues such as Europe, Trident, and even migration. But I'm not here to speak for the left, because we our chairman, John Boyd, and I think Brian Denny was here in the, in the morning, can do so with far more authority. The democracy movement has, however, been helping to prepare the ground for its resurgence of left Euroscepticism in very difficult times. And now I hope the left can be assured that they are not alone and are not going to be embarrassed, or as little as possible, <laughs> by the more rabid nationalist elements on the right who can sometimes lose more votes than they secure in British context. So it's important to understand that the British are actually imperialists, they often, but they're not racist. Um, I'm personally very much of the left, with a long track record of activist organisation in the Labour movement. Uh, but I've had two decades of association with DM, and it hasn't caused me a single problem in all that time. Now, there are issues. This is politics. Many on the left will still sit, not sit on a platform with some on the right. Democratic socialists will not always sit with democratic nationalists, but we do have a number of issues that are, are, are changing that. One is TTIP, which has come up more than once, and, and that was an excellent presentation earlier. Another is the utter, utter, utter incompetence of the European External <coughs> Action Service in Ukraine, which has exposed the lie of the European Union as an instrument of peace. And the appalling treatment of the Greek people is bringing activists together on both sides for this critical vote. Without a functioning representative democracy, answerable to the people, a people with a common history and struggle, there is no opportunity for left and right to contest the constitutional space if uh, the only constitutional space available is one dictated by lawyers and technocrats. That is a key argument. We may fight eventually, but we must fight within the same constitutional space and not be told what to do by, by bureaucrats. Which leads to the final independent initiative of DM alongside maintaining its campaigning asset and increasing understanding between left and right Democrats, which is the promotion of the ideal of democracy itself. 
what happened in Greece and is now happening in Portugal, which I'm not sure was mentioned this morning. Yes. Well, what's happening in Portugal is critical. It's a sharp reminder that we are faced by a postmodern imperial power that hides a brute corporatist economic force under a velvet glove of liberal ideology. So the democracy movement is actively pulling together and under Marx's leadership a second wave of British groups on the theme of national sovereign democracy, and these are wholly committed to the Leave vote when it comes. Now at last, let me speak of Leave.eu, which is what I was supposed to be speaking of. As you know, there are two Leave organisations in Britain. I can characterise Leave.eu as the mass-orientated one that seeks to mobilise the street, the people who really matter here, the voters. This is a vote. It's not a, it's not a deal. It's a vote. The other camp, originated by Business for Britain, is a far more elite operation dominated by members of Parliament of all parties and conservative business interests. Now, my own view is that there is room for both. They may be rivals for funding and attention, and some may say this is a disadvantage having two organisations. I kind of disagree, because there's room for an elite group and there's room for a mass group to have their own organisations, and I see no virtue in any public quarrels between the two of them. And I'll explain why I think it's good to have both. Because we're on the cusp of a major change in politics where power is shifting from the old elite politics to the new politics, which was represented in part by the power of social media and the rise of Jeremy Corbyn here. But I think we've heard that in many other countries something similar is happening. I was most struck by the developing progressive alliance in Ireland. There's Podemos, there's Syriza. There are, there are, there are more, shall we say, right organisations in Europe. But a new politics is emerging and it's speaking for the people. This radical new politics in this, politics in this country straddles party lines. So you have Labour's deputy leader, Tom Watson, matched by a Tory like Zach Goldsmith. And you have people like Douglas Carswell, who was the Tory who joined UKIP and is now a bit of a rebel from UKIP, and we can't, don't know quite where he stands, but he's definitely a Eurosceptic. And the Benite, or Benite left, both seeing the levellers, the radicals of the old English Republic, as part of their inheritance. Yet, the old politics, the elite politics, still has strong residual power. Some people will still be persuaded to their position by the leadership role of big beasts. And a very good point earlier was made about making sure that we have the endorsement of big beasts in this country. So the elite is still part of the game. So the question for the democracy movement was which way should we jump? Because we straddle it. And should we be elite guys or mass guys? Well, we believe that Leave, Leave EU is much closer to the new politics model, and, that, and, and, and in part, that the democracy movement was a pioneer of that approach. DM shares with Leave EU a belief in the ultimate wisdom of the people and in the need to communicate with them in a two-way dialogue. Not tell them what to do, but listen and, and make our arguments work with the people. So although no final commitment has been made, because the democracy movement, perfectly reasonably, wants to know that this carefully acquired campaigning asset will be managed appropriately and effectively, and it is early days, the democracy movement, like so many radical democratic organisations in this country, is minded to give its wholehearted commitment to leave EU at the right time. At some stage, there's another point in, in the British condition, conditions, is the Eurosceptical argument is going to have to be put to the people within the funding and other restrictions of the Electoral Commission. If you have questions on that, I'm going to refer you a question time to Mark at the back, who's expert at it. Um, you've, got, you've, got, you've got a very serious face. <laughs> now, I was going to say, though, that we do trust this body. We trust this body. It's non-partisan, and in our judgment, when faced with an elite or a mass offer, where the elite has a significant track... Not to. Track record of campaigning over decades, it must, if it is to be fair, go with the people and not the big beasts. But what I personally like about Leave EU is that it is not allowing itself to be the rabbit in the headlights of officialdom and not relying on that outcome. It knows that the pro-European European Union lobby has been planning its campaign for years, has accumulated massive resources, and it will have the same devious forces working for it as those who stole the first referendum vote in 1975. There's no advantage in hanging around until everything is perfect. Battle must be joined sooner rather than later. You can, you can access leave.eu by going leave.eu into Google. It's very easy to find. It has simply decided to bypass the old system, what it calls the Westminster bubble, and go into the struggle regardless. And we think that is entirely the right strategy, to do it now, start moving now, and not wait for things to be perfect. And on that note, I'm open to questions at the right time. Thank you. Well, I think Tim has uh, summed up one thing which has always been a problem in the 
Eurosceptic anti-EU movement in Britain is that the right don't understand the left and the left won't work with the right. Now we're trying to all the time dissipate that and say well you've got to sit down together even if we don't like sitting down together we have to sit down together and work this out. You're not working for anybody we're doing it for the safety of the country and everybody in it. So we'll come back.